When there's less human in the loop to make decisions, the more important it will be to ensure that there is no bias. Hello, and welcome to Hired the Podcast. I am Travis Miller, and this is a conversation about the world of work with some of the best and brightest minds in the business. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Britta Muhlenberg, the Chief Operations Officer at Acrolinks and former Chief People Officer there as well. She's over two decades of human resource operations and startup experience. Um, as Chief Operations Officer, Britta leads Acrolinx's customer division, ensuring customer retention and satisfaction. Britta, thanks for being with us here today. Appreciate it. Well, welcome too, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm pleased to be with you today. Absolutely. And I'm I'm so curious, Britta, um, you not too long ago made the transition from Chief People Officer to Chief Operations Officer, and you spent the vast majority of your career in Human Resources, VP of Human Resources, Chief People Officer. What has it been like shifting to a bit broader focus when you are not solely focused on the people at the organizations you're working? Well, yeah. So first of all, this is my second time around that I'm chief operating officer of a company. In my previous company, I had the same, pretty much the same transition, starting in a people function and then moving into operations with a little bit of a different, um, you know, with a little bit of a different, um, you know, functional cut, if you wish. I was responsible there for to work actually with the product and engineering teams, and I had IT and cloud operations under my wing there uh, as well. So this is not very new to me. And I believe that people and operations go extremely well together because, um, you know, being in charge of, you know, especially in a tech company like Acrolinx, the most important asset of this company are its people, the brains, the talents, right? And making sure that we leverage the talents to, you know, the best success of the company is ultimately what I do in my operations role. I make sure that all the great talent that we have collaborates well, interacts well, and ultimately creates value for our customers, who, by the way, are also people, right? So, you know, working with our customers is a pleasure for me because you know, I'm, I have people on the other side of the table as well and making sure that their needs are met and their experience is a great one. Um, there are quite a lot of similarities between being in charge of people and being in charge of customers. So again, I think that people and operations have to go hand in hand anyway. And combining the two in one leadership role makes a ton of sense for me and has not been a very difficult transition for me at all. Uh, for those listening that aren't familiar with, uh, with Acrolinks, I find it terribly refreshing to hear uh, somebody working for a generative AI company say that people are their most important asset. Because um, you read so much in the news and hear so much scaremongering of people saying that AI is going to take all our jobs away or and I, I just, I personally don't, don't see it. And to hear that coming from someone like you is incredibly f refreshing. How do you see artificial intelligence affecting the uh, job market, the hiring landscape, and how people focus on who to bring on board and how to utilize them? That's a, that's a million dollar question that you're asking me here. <laughs> um, and there's, there's a lot of aspects to it, but let me start by saying that, um, at Acrolinks, Acrolinks is a company that's been around for a while, right? We've been uh, in business for 20 years and we've always been an AI company, right? Way before anybody else was thinking about and or knowing anything about AI. So it sits as the heart at the you know, it's the DNA of our company. And I don't think that being human and AI really contradict each other at all. Um, and so where while there are many companies or actually all companies around the globe looking at, you know, what's happening in the generative AI space right now and trying to figure out how to best leverage the technology and how to incorporate the technology into their workflows. 
and being, you know, some of them being really scared about what's coming and not knowing, you know, the uncertainty of it, that's not so much um, present at Acrolings. We're all very excited about this because this finally helps us, you know, because many more people understand uh, actually what we do and why Acrolings is important. So, um, so that may be to start off with. And then to your question about how will it change, nobody knows at this point. I think it's the the one mistake that we can do is to assume that it won't have an impact. I do mm -hmm. believe that it'll impact phenomenally and very, very significantly the way in which we work. Having said that, organizations, from my perspective, are organisms more than they are engines. And that's always the way in which I have looked at organizations. And, and that's not going to change. So there's people interacting, they might be doing different things and they might be using different skills. They might be leveraging the technology in different ways. Generative AI might and will help us a lot with efficiency, speed of innovation, speed of creating value and being productive and all of that. But, you know, ultimately there will still be people in organizations doing business with people in other organizations, and that's not going away. So the need for humanness in leadership, in coaching, in giving direction, in inspiration, you know, in, in training, and also, as you said, in recruiting and selecting the right talents for an organization, that's going to stay the same. We're just going to have a different you know, tool in our tool belt that we can use. And specific, and I mean, you know, I've been asked this question so many times, right? How does this impact the way in which people, teams work? There are a million ways in which generative AI can support workflows in the people organization. You mentioned recruiting, right? Yes, for sure. I mean, you know, using generative AI to create job descriptions, to, you know, go look for, for profiles, to map profiles with uh, requirements or job specs, that's all great because it can be done, especially if it, you need to do it at scale, it can be done by a machine. But I think this does not take away the need for us to be very specific about uh, making sure we don't have a bias baked into these models that are, you know, used to make those selections. And and I think actually when there's less human in the loop to make decisions, the more important it will be to ensure that there is no bias, you know, in the models and in the technology that we use. The same is true for creating content for learning, right? It's, it's the old concept, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have great ideas and good foundation as input for whatever it is that you're using to create learning content, then it'll be hard to use or to, to best leverage that learning content that is AI generated, right? So, um, so basically what I'm saying is that even though the machine's gonna help us and the technology is gonna help us be much more efficient and quicker and focus on other things, uh, it'll not take away humans and organizations and in the, wor in the world of work and, and as long as there are humans in the world of work, there will be a need for leadership. There will be a need for coaching. There will be a need for, you know, communication and ensuring that there is a culture that needs to be nourished. And and so those things will still be and maybe even more so be top of mind of uh, leaders in people functions, I think. Plus, I mean, leaders not only, um, I have to correct myself, this is true for any leader, not just pe leaders and people functions. Uh, are there any specific ways that you've uh, started to utilize this tool or seen it uh, shift or shape uh, your role or your team or your department in any given ways? Um, well, so we're using our own tool, of course, right? We're making sure that uh, the content that we create is checked with Acrolinks. So our job descriptions, our internal communications, anything that we create here. And that's, by the way, that's true for all of Acrolinks, not just the people team, is being checked by our own um, technology there. And we're using that. And in other ways, um, as I said, it's it's at the very center of who we are to be in touch with AI. So we're not afraid of it so much. But as any other company, Acrolinks also has to create policies around it because there is risk attached to it, right? Data protection, those kinds of things. Uh, we might be a bit 
less hesitant in approaching and using these technologies. Um, and we're actually, we, we've just last week, a couple of weeks ago, have launched our own generative AI component in our product. And everybody was very excited about it um, to be able to use it in, in, in Acrolinks, right? So we don't have to go to other places. We could just use Acrolinks for those, for this purpose. But in other ways, I have to, I have to admit not yet. I mean, it's not like we're using top-notch um, generative AI tools to create our internal learning content. Um, it hasn't gone that far, but it might, and I guess it will. How do you think that's going to shape how, how the learning content is created, and is it going to, sh to shape differently how the content is consumed? Um, the consumption piece is an interesting one because that has to do, I guess that's less an AI question, but more a, a question of, you know, because the channels are clear at the moment, right? That they're, they're video, they're audio, they're, uh, they're reading materials, uh, or a combination of them. Um, you know, they're video and also interaction in, in pre-recorded training materials might get more sophisticated, right? The way in which you interact while you're doing online training, that will probably change. Uh, but I think that for the generation piece, I do see that that it'll um, it'll be impacted quite significantly because that the whole idea of online training, um, I think the biggest piece of it is making sure that you create high quality content, right? That is uh, didactically valuable, that, you know, is, is, is uh, entertaining, that is uh, engaging, it's attractive um, so that people stay on and, and that it meets the purpose. It does have the challenge, if you want to use generative AI for the learning content, you do have the challenge of making sure that the model you're using, um, you know, has a way of uh, tapping into, into knowledge, the knowledge that you're trying to get across, because it's usually very specific. Mm -hmm. And as we all, as we know now, there's lots of hallucinations. So you have to find ways in which you need to, you know, have, you know, specifically train your models or ground your models to, for that specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And then always the language piece, right? You want to make sure that the language that's being used to train the model is um, free of bias, is inclusive, um, and ultimately adheres to the style that, that the company, that the creating company would like to apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd imagine that's extremely challenging. I know that you recently uh, certified in uh, Brene Brown's Dare to Lead training, and how how do you... I can't imagine how much work and time and effort that took for you to become certified in that. How do you possibly train a train a machine to create that equivalent content that is as valuable as someone like you who has all of this, not only this previous knowledge, but this new knowledge? How can that possibly compete with someone like you and what you bring, how you bring that to your team? Yeah, I think you have to differentiate between the different um, the different types of training or what it is that you want to train, right? Training knowledge, I would think, is easier because it is knowledge is easier to capture than than human connection and you know empathy. I mean, how do you train empathy through a model? Mm -hmm. That's really difficult. And I mean, you mentioned Brene Brown and, and we went through that whole process as a leadership team. And I don't see a, a future in which this experience can be done solely by, um, you know, by, by, by an AI uh, or a bot or anything. We had a certified, we had a certified trainer who, who did that with us. And I mean, just the presence of this person, um, the, the beautiful Caroline Shop Kelderen, who did that with us, her presence, her energy, you know, and having the energy of the group, even though it was all done remotely, right? We had like 35 people uh, in the room, in our virtual room, getting together every week for the training, but at creating the energy, creating the momentum, sharing experiences and building on that. I don't think that'll be, you know, you'll be able to, to replace that or, um, you know, 
have that kind of depth and humanness in a purely robotic setting, to be quite frank. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it will happen, or maybe this world is going to try to do that. I doubt it'll be effective. Yeah. I'm, uh, I saw in the news recently, I'm very curious to see how it works, but I read that for the Olympics, they're using Al Michaels' voice to create custom AI commentary specifically for the individual watching it. And is that going to create an uncanny valley? Could of, uh, I know it's not Al Michaels. I know it's not this, this famous person that I've watched on television and seen comment on sports for decades. I know it's not this person, but it's his voice. It's, am I going to be able to receive that? And I think about something like this. Could you have a training meeting with a robot version of Brene Brown? It's her voice. It's the model has been built on her training, but it's not her. I just don't know if that's something that us as humans would ever be able to to take at the same level of value. Mm. I would agree. Um, there is there is so much um, sensuality in this very human experience of specifically this topic. I mean, the topic that we were dealing with was vulnerability in the workplace. It's it's courage, it's trust, there's, you know, shame. Those are topics that are extremely difficult. And um, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it was a very bodily, very sensual experience to listen to your coworkers share their stories or share your own story or just, you know, discussing the concepts and uh, either in the large group or in the smaller group. Um, and that is, you know, that needs immediate response. And this, this is going to be, I think this is, it's going to be impossible to create this momentum and create this atmosphere without any human interaction, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I really, again, I think, I think it, it really depends a lot on, are you training knowledge or are you training something else Tra to, to kind of coach human behavior, train human behavior, speak about values? I think that's going to be very, very hard to, to replace. Albeit, Brene was with us, even though it was she wasn't doing the training, right? What, what has happened in the past and it's very effective is that we were watching videos where she would speak to parts of her book and you know some of the concepts and so she did join us virtually in a way but that was not interactive that was like interspersed and that'll work and i think i mean we kind of consume other people's voices and faces and and, and facial expressions and i mean you and I were not in the same room, right? And right. we're still having an engaged conversation. So it's possible. But I think having something that is predetermined, even if it's intelligent and can react, reading a room, picking up a sentiment, and then reacting to that. I mean, I'm not an engineer. I don't, I don't know, you know, what's all possible, but I would find that very hard. And the question is, would we want that? I mean, that it's, it's just, you know, we had sessions and where there were tears and that, I mean, you don't want that to be invoked or, you know, um, enticed by a machine. That's, uh, that's deeply human. It's deeply human. So, and back to my point of organizations being organisms with a soul and a heart and people in them, it's a culture and feelings and, and that that's not going away. We're humans. I caught that quote earlier and I really liked it, that an organization is an organism, not an engine. And I thought that was, that was very poetic. And I want to hear more about, um, about the training. What did you take away from these sessions with, um, with Brene's team? And what are you taking to the rest of your organization and trying to, uh, what knowledge are you trying to pass on to them? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> maybe I should start from why did we 
why did we embark on that journey? And it was about the need for more courage, the need for more courage in, in the organization to um, to to put the difficult conversations on the table and to address the difficult and more challenging topics head on instead of avoiding them and, you know, like not speaking to people directly about issues at hand. And because if you have that, if you don't have conflict, if an organization is so respectful with one another that you're, you're absolutely trying to avoid any kind of friction, any kind of conflict, um, that can lead to a lack of innovation. And, you know, you don't solve issues. They get stale and they get stuck and build. And so that was something that we wanted to avoid, especially in a fully remote setting where it is extremely valuable and necessary to solve issues because otherwise they will they will fester and they will grow and will become, you know, bigger. So that was the initial purpose. and. And ultimately, that is the outcome, right? We have, through this program, A, grown together as a leadership team, the wider leadership team. So this was all people, leaders, so to speak, in the organization who got together there. And then we took, <clears throat> after doing the certified course with the leaders, we did uh, what they call the Daring Teams Rollout Program, where 15 of us leaders then took this program to the rest of the organization in smaller groups. And we actually, we just, just finalized our second go around of that. Um, so I'm super happy to see that we're continuing the journey. And it's phenomenal to see how it has shaped and changed the way in which we interact as, a, as an organization. And the most visible element of that is language. Back to our first topic, right, and to our Acrolinks topic, maybe, because we have learned not only a set of tools and concepts that we can all allude to and rely on um, in our daily interaction, but it is a, a set of language and vocabulary that we can use to make ourselves heard and seen, right? So as an example, there's um, there's specific language in the concept or in, in Dare to Lead that speaks of having a rumble as instead of having a difficult conversation. Or, you know, I have, um, you know, I really, I have an idea and I've made a sketch of what I want it to look like, but it's it's called a shitty first draft. Excuse <laughs> my French here. We call it a shitty first draft. And, and, and if somebody now shares that, then you know, okay, it's for me to look at, but I know it's not done. Or um, the, the idea of back channeling, if I don't address a topic or a question or an issue head on, but I, I, you know, leave a meeting feeling uncomfortable, but then talking to somebody else about the topic. That's back channeling. And we can address these things. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, speaking of invisible armies, speaking of stories that we make up in our heads. So there's uh, many, many, many uh, examples of vocabulary that we can that we can use and that is being used every single day. So uh, I'm super happy to hear somebody mention something about this program every single day. And it's um, it's refreshing. And, and we're also doing refreshers with the teams now because people have asked for it because you forget. I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't read it all the time. But what I've seen is that we have learned how to be clear and kind. We are more clear in what it is that we see. Uh, there is more courage in addressing. And it's less about avoiding conflict, mm -hmm. right? It's less about, hey, give me rules so that I don't have this issue. You will have misunderstandings and you will have friction. You know, it's inevitable. You know, there's, we have 180 people who are based and located around the world who have very, very different cultural backgrounds. Only around about half of our team is English native. So you have the language barrier, you have a cultural barrier, and you're only working together via a screen. That makes it really hard. There will be conflict. There will be misunderstanding. And it is absolutely important for us to get that out of the way and to be as empathetic as we can be and as generous, always assuming the person in front of me is trying their best. They're not here to hurt me or to do harm to me or to my cause. We're all, we're all on the same page. We just need to figure out how. And that's uh, beautiful to see. How have you seen uh, this, this teaching uh, received and utilized uh, across the different cultures? That's inter an interesting question. Um, but ultimately, 
I think it's less about the cultures. It's more about the uh, like a, the normal distribution of people, right? You have your normal uh, distribution curve, and as usual, you have this like twenty to thirty percent, maybe twenty percent of like people who are really engaged and who love this and who embrace it and will take it to the next level and adopt it immediately. Then you have the bulk of the people who are a little more skeptical and hesitant and we'll, you know, see how it goes. And then you have your group of people who are really, really super skeptical and actually against it and mm -hmm. who don't like it and, and who will not adopt it. But that didn't discourage me because that's a normal set of things. But I did not see specifically different um, levels of adoption or engagement or receptiveness to this depending on culture, <laughs> I must say. I mean, we did have the language barrier a little bit because we did it in English, obviously. And there is, um, you know, some of this language is, is uh, very specific. And, and there, were, you know, we had a few people who were struggling a little bit to understand the language mm -hmm. that was being used. But we also had German, you know, uh, German content. And, 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 and so um, we, I think we maneuvered those issues. And so I, I would say it wasn't a matter of culture or regional or regional, um, you know, or location, but more so the, the normal split of, of human receptiveness to this. Yep. That's pretty normal. I want to hear your thoughts on creating a culture of healthy conflict. How do you do that where you're encouraging people to get in disagreements and how were you able to almost emphasize that this is this is about the topic this is not this conflict is not personal and does it ever devolve into that that's a journey right it's a journey that we're on every day and and i don't think we're perfect and there will be situations where there is uh where there is you know hurt feelings and where people you know perceive something as being personal but generally what i see and what the leadership team has really really done well is to encourage the direct conversation and you know you, you know how it goes sometimes in very hierarchical organizations issues bubble up to the very top they're being escalated and they then they trickle down the other side mm -hmm. but the people who have the issue together who do have that you know, factual or matter of fact conflict, they never speak to one another. And then it kind of hangs in the air and it doesn't get resolved. And we all encourage our teams to have that conversation with their peers. And we provide coaching as to how could that happen. Um, but it, we've seen that increase actually to not kind of go through the ranks mm -hmm. and then down the other side, but to actually have this conversation directly with the person on the other side and it's it's a constant it's a constant um well it's a constant learning path mm -hmm. and so but it's it's working it is working and i, I mean i was speaking of back channeling earlier yeah. seeing that and and spotting that and calling it out has been tremendously helpful because we can also you're back channeling channeling right now can you go have a conversation with this person and it's uncomfortable. It's, you know, oftentimes I see people when they come to me and ask for advice and how am I going to solve this and complaining, you know, with me. And I tell them, go have a conversation with this person. And they're, ah, it's, you know, <laughs> I don't want to. It's really uncomfortable. Um, but I, yeah, I don't let them off the hook. Um, mm -hmm. So that's uh, it's something that we all and and it's I mean it's the same for me right I need to have my conversations head on mm -hmm. but um and that's not always easy I mean it's not always easy to have those conversations but uh, I try to embrace it every day. How often do they back out and just go? Nah, never mind. It's not that big a deal. I'm just not going to have the conversation. <laughs> well, I don't know that because I can't follow up on everything. But <laughs> um, I I do see that the level of um you know, readiness to have difficult conversations has gone up. Um, and also because of this idea of um, being clear, but being kind is important, right? You can be very clear and you can set very clear boundaries, but you have to be, kind. it's not mutually exclusive from being a kind person. Mm -hmm. You can be very, very strong in your statement, but you don't have to be, you know, um, mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can still be kind, uh -huh. right? So there's been a strong focus on um, 
the encouragement to have difficult conversations, but I, I want to shift a little bit and talk about the difficulty of having positive conversations. I read an, um, an interview you did in HR Daily Advisor recently, and you said, early on in my career, I'd always been a very he heads down, diligent person and never paid too much attention to sharing what I did with others. I realized fairly quickly that this was actually to my detriment. And unfortunately, I think that it is a very typical female pattern to hope that people will notice the good things that you do. And as I was reading that, I thought of the Barbie movie, um, the speech that America Ferreira gives. And she says, uh, you have to have money, but you can't ask for money because that's crass. You have to be a boss, but you can't be mean. You have to lead, but you can't squash other people's ideas. And I wanted to hear your thoughts because um, I, I can see your, your point that it can be um, more a problem more prevalent in females. But I know it's something that I run into and I see people run into all the time, the difficult challenges of being able to proudly state what you've done and what you've accomplished without coming across like a braggart, a blowhard, someone with, with ego. How have you faced that challenge and what have you do to encourage it in, in your people? Yeah, I think that's a very fine line that you need to find, right? Um, between bragging or not bragging, but still talking about the things that you have done. I think first and foremost, it's about, I mean, success is usually not something that you do on your own. So it's as a leader or, you know, if, if, if you have larger teams that work with you, it's super important to kind of you know, share the joy of the success and not just own the success and say, hey, I did that, but mm -hmm. actually the team did that, right? So that's number one. Number two is I do believe that it's important to gain real estate. You know, if you want to progress, if you, if you, I mean, if you want to um, develop, if you want to grow, it's, you know, it's about creating awareness about yourself. It's almost like a marketing campaign a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't, you don't need to have a huge billboard with all your good successes on them, but it is about creating real estate and by making sure that what it is that you do is being seen and heard. Um, and that is something that for, for me, it's not my DNA, but I had to learn it, right? To be very intentional about where do I share? Where do I... Where do I try to uh, create attention? And and honestly, you know, people have so much going on. There's so much information. You know, it's this 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 you know overflowing of of things that are on people's plates. And you want to grab attention. You want to make sure they see and hear what you have to say. That is, I mean. I mean, you will know that, right? I mean, this is like so hard. It's becoming more and more difficult. And the same is true, I believe, in in your achievements, right? Making sure that you connect what it is that you do with the success of the larger cause is important. Repeating it is important. Um, and I, I, again, I don't think it's necessarily, it needs to be fueled by ego, right? Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that if it's if it's fueled by the cause of, making sure the success is seen and because it you it you don't do things just to look good you to be, I, I don't i do the things that i do to progress the company that i work with or to progress the team or to you know, get in get ahead with my uh you know with my objectives and i think as long as you connect the things that you do with that uh and not so much with your own person i think that'll do the job, but it is necessary to do it. It's not, people will not sit there and wait for you, you know, wait for you to, uh, or they won't go look for the things that somebody has done well. I mean, as humans, we tend to have more focus on ne negative things. It's our DNA. <laughs> we can't help it. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that is what will catch our attention much more easily than, than, um, you know, the good things. So we have to repeat them. Mm -hmm. We have to, talk about them. I've also noticed that the, um, the more you do it for, for others, the more they'll do it for you. Very true. Very true statement. I mean, that's, you know, 
being a leader for such a long time and, and seeing many other leaders around me and learning from the good and, you know, maybe um, checking off my list from, from some that I didn't find were so good, I think one one thing that stuck with me is is the whole idea of uh, being a servant leader, right? Mm -hmm. People don't work for me. I actually work for them and we work together. So, and I think that's a big shift in how leadership is perceived, you know. There were days where that was very different, but today, at least for me, um, I, I don't have this feeling of, you know, my teams, they, again, they don't work for me. I work for them. I make sure that they have everything they need to be successful. I make sure that, that we kind of get the blockers out of the way. I make sure that they feel that like they're in a safe space and they can thrive. And, and that is a very different idea from you know, sitting in your corner office and waiting for people to kind of report back to you what it is that they've done greatly. Mm -hmm. I forget who I was talking. Noah, do you remember who it was I was talking to that they talked about the idea of, as a leader, the people who work on your team or work at your company, they're not employees. They're almost your customers. And it's your job to continue to provide value to them all the time in order for them to continue to, for lack of a better term, pay you through the work that they're doing and the, and the product that they're helping to put out there and the revenue that they're generating for your company. Mm -hmm. And I just love that idea that, yeah, the people aren't working for me. I am working for them and I need to ensure that this is a place where they want to continue to provide value. Mm -hmm. But just an interesting idea that I really, really loved. Yeah, it's and it's true. I mean, it's you know we at Acrolinks we measure people engagement on a regular basis um, because that for us is a very important. It's a KPI. It's actually a company KPI of ours, um, but we do that because we want to know, you know, the level of engagement and how how eager are people to be working at Acrolinks. How strong is their emotional bond to the company? You know, it's not about how satisfied are they? That also plays a role, but that's not all of it. It's about really how how strong is their emotional connection with Acrolinks. And and the things, if you look at the elements or the levers that kind of go into this scoring, it's about giving people purpose, giving people direction, making sure what they do has a meaning, um, making sure they know somebody cares about them and cares for them, making sure that they feel like they can grow and, and de uh, develop. And, and also even to, all the way down to very basic things. Do they have the tools they need to do their job? Do they know what is, what it is that they, that is expected of them? Mm -hmm. And also, do you give them the chance to show their superpowers every day. Mm -hmm. right? So there's, and those are the elements that we ask about and that we want to find out about. And ultimately it's on us as an employer to make sure that, that those things are in place and that we show appreciation and show, um, you know, enable growth, enable development, um, but also provide purpose so that people know the why they get up and, and get to work every morning. Is that and, the uh, um, Gallup 12 that you're using to measure that? Or is there some other? Yes, tools? it is. No, it's a Gallup. It's the Gallup Q12. And we enrich that with obviously with some other questions. But that's, uh, that's the main score that we use. Yes. <laughs> Good 12. How, uh, how have you seen that, that shift? And, and I apologize for not knowing this. Have you always been a fully remote company? Or is that a more recent development? Um, um, yes and no. So, uh, Acrolinks has always been geographically dispersed, uh, in over Europe and, uh, the U S and there have always been a sprinkle of people who were, you know, some in Japan, a little bit in Australia. Uh, but with about two and a half years ago, we decided to go remote first and to start hiring globally, at least for some functions, right? There are some roles where it's more difficult because you have time zone barriers and you have language barriers and etc but for the majority of our roles we are fully remote and we are not a large company but we have about 20 countries that we work in and um and yeah so it was a very clear 
decision to do that. Uh, we still have offices, um, our headquarters in Berlin and a small office in Concord and close to Boston. But, um, but yeah, we, so the fully remote and um, that, that setting has only started about two and a half years ago. Because the one question on the Gallup 12 that I, I think about a lot with fully remote em- employees and fully remote teams is, do I have a best friend at work? <laughs> and that's the one, the one big piece of the hybrid remote framework that I I just wonder about. And I don't know. I honestly can't say I don't don't know how necessary it is to have a best friend at work. But I wonder how much of that has changed and shifted over the last four four years or so. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent topic, Travis. We could probably have an entire podcast just based on that question um, or on that topic. It's the most discussed question in our company. Um, and I've had everything from, yes, of course, this is important. And yes, of course, I have a best friend here up, you know, all the way to, I don't, it, it's this work. Well, why would I have a best friend? And I don't ever have a best friend at work because my best friends is just this one person on the planet. So <laughs> it's a huge topic. It's very, very wildly discussed. Um, but for me, people don't see that this is not a yes, no question. Mm-hmm. It's a scale of five, right? How how would you rate your, um, you know, your social connectivity with your peers, with your coworkers? That is ultimately the question. And whether we like it or not, the level of emotional connection with my employer is different if somebody who I consider a friend works there too. It's just, a, it's a fact. And mm-hmm. so the question is relevant from my perspective, at least. And, and then we can discuss this. It is I mean, back to the fact that we're all humans and we need um, to bond and to, you know, create connection. We need to be in touch physically. I mean, you know, it's oxytocin that flows when we touch each other, when we're close to each other. I mean, that's just who we are um, and we're wired for that. So there is always a very uh, strong need to get people together. And that's so I think being fully remote is not a savings idea. Because you have to invest in getting people together physically, I believe. Um, And so it's about making sure that that happens, but also making sure that where that is not possible all the time, that you and we we pay a lot of attention to that, where you create opportunities for people to engage with one another outside of work topics, right? So um, we... We're very creative, uh, and I think we can still do better, very creative about setting up book clubs, setting up, um, uh, you know, we have an active club. So we we actually, we've, you know, we've got a, a Slack channel that where we share, uh, where we share our uh, activities and where we do active challenges. Everybody does them in their own time and in their own region, but we kind of throw it in together and we, hmm. we kind of work out together and we cheer each other on. That is one. Then, you know, uh, we have a cats and dogs channel where people <laughs> share Im- images of their cats and dogs. We even have a home automation channel where, you know, the, the nerds in the company can share their latest and greatest about their home automation. And it's a very active <laughs> channel. So it's we have a share the love channel uh, where people can share things that kind of makes their heart flow over where there's a lot of like, uh, you know, chatter, charitable donation stuff in there or just volunteer, volunteer work. So it, you have to be a bit creative in making sure people see each other as humans mm-hmm. and not just through, you know, in a Zoom meeting or in the next Zoom meeting and in the next Zoom meeting. But it's it's possible, right? You need to you need to provide a canvas for people to paint a portrait of themselves. And we're also um, trying to be very human as leaders, right? So for example, the entire executive leadership team, we always check in with all of our new employees, our new hires. We get them together, check in with them 15, 20 minutes um, to say hi, to introduce ourselves, to talk about what it is that we do. I mean, chief operating officer can be anything, right? Uh, So I share what I do. And uh, we always have, um, some of us have a slide and some of us just speak to who we are as people, right? We talk about where we live and about our children or our pets and what it is that we like to do in our spare time, just so people see that we're also humans, by the way. We're not just important people who have huge titles and, you know, are very scary, but we're actually humans. And that is not 
easy in a fully remote setting, but I believe it's possible. I, again, it's some it's a journey. We're I wouldn't say we're we've got it all figured out, but we're learning and it's exciting. Those channels that you set up, was that something that was an initiative from the chief people officer, or was that something that organically happened from people just being like, I got some buds here that we're all into into food and cooking. Here's our here's our food channel. We have a food channel too, as you may imagine. Um, that's both, actually. I, both. Uh, we've had a few that were initiated by myself, some that were created by my team, uh, and but others that just happened from because people said, you know, we have a joint interest here. Let's start a Slack channel. Let's let's start a community about that. But it needs nourishing. It doesn't just happen, right? It needs it needs nourishing and, and constant engagement. Yes. Well, there's the, there's the word is is community and creating an environment where communities can flourish. Uh, Britta, this has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, if people are interested in finding out more about you or about Acrolinks, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Oh, I would say the usual, right? Find me on LinkedIn um, and happy to connect there. And Acrolinks is also on LinkedIn and obviously our website. So if you want to learn more about us, uh, visit acrolinks.com. Britta Muhlenberg, this has been Hired the Podcast. Really, really appreciate the conversation. Thank you as always to Noah Cuff, our producer. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.